obviously, and never know where I'm going to go anyway. Uh, I'll just try to take you along. Uh, <clears throat> I better get these coins out of my pocket or I'll play with them all night. <laughs> I do those things. He's like, get rid of them earlier. I'd like to discuss something to start out with, and you'll wonder why this is part of a meeting in which uh, uh, of the type of sub. I don't know exactly everything that's been advertised to you, and that's good. I didn't read the handbill, and I'm not constrained by having to follow it. But I want to talk first about uh, basically knowledge and uh, our education system somewhat, and about a thing we'll get into some science and we'll discuss a thing called evolution. And you may wonder where I'm going to go with it, but if you'll hang on there, and if you understand what I'm saying in the first half, I think you'll understand what's happening to us. Uh, I think you'll understand uh, the, the, the drift, the direction in which we as a nation are taking, uh, we as a people and, our, and as our families and as a political units. And the other thing is that the things that are happening are not accidental. Things don't just happen. What's in your newspaper today is not what happened to happen today. It's what was scheduled to happen today. And the thing is, remember this, when you read the newspaper, you, for example, you see all the worldwide coverage of one person, say, a Bobby Sands, all right? Now, if the press didn't want to cover Bobby Sands, he would have just died in that prison, like lots of people died in prison. Nobody would ever know anything about it. It wouldn't mean a thing, would it? The reason why you're hearing about Bobby Sands is because the establishment wants you to hear about Bobby Sands. And they have a reason for that. Now, maybe sometimes you have a kind of a, uh, maybe it's kind of hard to guess the reason. But there is a reason. The purpose of the media is to create attitudes, attitudes in your mind to accept or reject certain things in which they want you to accept or reject. Now, my father, who was a rather wise man, he had an eighth grade education uh, and came off of the sand dunes in northern Michigan with 25 cents in his pocket at 14 as his mother kissed him and sent him out in the world. But with a lack of so-called formal education, he was one of the, the smartest men I ever met. Maybe that's because uh, <clears throat> he died when I was 21, and therefore I, uh, I knew him as a teenager, and I was very impressed by him. But he was a rather, uh, he had some very fundamental ideas, as older people seem to have, particularly as we go back a couple generations. These people sitting out in these farm land and so forth, they didn't go to school. They just had something called smarts thing called common sense, something that most people, when they get out of college, has been driven out of you. You have been told that your common sense, what seems to be right, is wrong. And that now you have a whole new set of values in which are so, bar so much more sophisticated and wise of the world uh, than the good old common sense. But there are a few little axioms my father taught me in which I have operated by and I have found have been very successful. I tell people sometimes, I said, you want to get rich? I'll tell you how to get rich. My father became a millionaire twice with 25 cents to start out with. And depression wiped him out and he came back and did it again with diabetes and a bad heart. But he ruled one by one little old rule. And I can tell you this, anybody here wants to be a millionaire, I'll tell you how to do it. Just follow the rule. Live on half your income. He always lived in half his income. I've always lived in half my income. When you live in half your income, you got the other half to make more with. Now you say, oh boy, if I lived in half my income now, it would be pretty tight. Well, that's what it is when you start out. It's pretty tight. And no matter how dumb you are, you can keep losing over and over again, but you're going to make it sooner or later if you live in half your income. Even the dumbest guy will make it. You don't have to have many smarts. You see? You just follow the rule. But yet another one, and this is the one I want to get to, and that is... As he always used to tell me, he says, son, your judgment is no better than your information. You think that you can just think on things, you've got to have something to think with. You've got to have something to think upon. There's information, data that you've got in. Uh, last couple of weeks, I bought myself one of these little computers, which I'm putting my business records and so forth on. My eyeballs are going, they say, when you get where well, you can't see anymore, you're getting to be a computer programmer. But anyway, I've been punching at this little thing. But you know, it's... It is the most stupid thing. You sit there and say, here's a machine that can do all these things so fast, but it cannot, do, cannot think at all. If one little bit has gone, one little speck out of the two million you got on there, one little speck is missing, it can't jump over that speck and say, oh, I know what it meant. It cannot do any thinking whatsoever. That speck is gone, the whole thing goes down, you see? 
It does this little stupid thing very fast. Outside of its speed, it has nothing to go in for. And the fact is that they don't uh, ask you for ra raises as often. Uh, the only advantages of these machines. But you see, that machine cannot operate on anything unless there was something put into it. You sit there and buy a computer, sit it there and start punching buttons, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. You've got to feed a program in there. You've got to put in data in there. Uh, it's every instruction, every store, every bring back, every calculation, all got to be on that program. That machine can't do anything except what's been put into it. It does nothing on its own. And you are somewhat that way. In fact, you're quite a bit that way. You think that you just think on your own. No, you don't. You think on what people have been feeding you. One of the reasons, of course, for the so-called uh, public education system is not to educate, it is to indoctrinate. You know what the difference is? One education would be to give you different views of things. But this school system is not to give you different views and different pros and cons and different people's ideas, but a official view on all things. So that you are programmed to react. Now, there's a called a reactionary. What is a reactionary? An actionary is one who does things. A reactionary is who does things in response to what somebody else has done. When you do things in response to other people, you are their puppet. I don't care whether you think you're doing it on your own or not. As much as if you had a chain around your leg, it wouldn't make any difference because they can predict your responses. They can have a whole, you see, it used to be, and these are things that kind of bother me, I, a little older, and there's some people in this room somewhat older than I am, not too many. Uh, but I can remember back, you know, in the 30s and so forth, every little town and the 40s so forth in this country was different. It has flavor, it had its own people, it had its look about it. Today, it's the same McDonald's, you go into, I, 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 I travel all over this country, I've probably been in, in, in thousands of towns, in every place, I can go uh, in the west, the south, the east, anywhere. You can't tell one from the other except by the little foliage on uh, some of the bushes, you wouldn't know where you were. It is, it is, we're all regimented, every high school is the same, every football team is the same, the cheerleaders are the same, they're running that same game everywhere. It's just like it's on a program and they're cranking it out and we're puppets on this string dancing with little marionettes, playing our games. I'll give you a couple examples. Now these things may shock you a little bit and these are just little things to think on, throwing you a little, oh, 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 by the way, why am I here? All right, and I hope why you're here. I'm here to put some more data into your computer bank. And I'm only reason why I, I make these talks, I have yet to make a dollar out of one. When I do, I give it away, because I don't want anybody to say I make a dollar from these things. But I do it for one reason. I see uh, people are so much on this string, it really gives me enjoyment to see some people have something else to think about uh, a little different, you know, to keep the pot stirring maybe a little bit, see? And what I'm going, my whole intention is, uh, why I'm here, is to give you those things that you will not get elsewhere. Now, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but whatever it is, it's going to be different. It's going to throw that into your pot, take it with the other stuff, churn it up and see what you get, come out with. All right, so I'm going to be giving you a whole new set or a, a different set of data. Uh, some of you heard tapes of mine and some have heard me years ago. Well, I will tell you, I won't say that the same thing tonight I did 10 years ago. I don't believe what I believed 10 years ago. Now, I think there's something wrong with somebody who believes the same thing now as he did 10 years ago. If you haven't grown at all and if you haven't changed your beliefs, you haven't been doing much thinking. Of course, thinking is relatively difficult. Most people avoid it for a lifetime. What is easy to do, you go to the average teacher in school and what are they doing? They're parroting out the books they got in college. They're parroting back what they heard and it's just, you might as well take a tape recorder. You know, they, that's all they needed to bring because they're not giving you anything that they thought of. Oh, they sound like they're very profound that they thought it, but they didn't. They got it and they're just like a friend of mine. We used to always say about him, if you read the book against the grain, you know Dick. If you know Dick, you've already read the book against the grain. You don't need to read it. And he had read a book and he parrots this stuff out the rest of his life. And that's fine. But at, at first, if you meet the guy, you think, wow, what a brain. Till after you understand, after a while, that's all it is. It's just a continual record going over and over and over. There's no thinking going on. And that's the way most people are, I'm afraid. Now, if I insult anybody here, uh, I'll be insulted, but be mostly insulted if I don't insult you. 
one of the things that I do is uh, try to insult everybody so that we can all feel nicely equal somehow uh, before I through. I'll step on toes. Now, when I, if I would come here and talk to you and say those things that would not offend anybody here, I have to end up saying really nothing of any importance. I hope you understand that. And if you're going to get down and really talk about things that are important, it's going to hurt. I was on the plane coming over here today, and, and the fellow next to me was reading a book uh, by a guy named Bonhoeffer. And it's a, a, a book about a minister in the, in the Third Reich, a preacher over in Germany. And so we got talking a little bit about the Bible. Well, the guy on the other side, he chimes in. Well, this guy hadn't read two words in the Bible, but he had all of his opinions, and he was going with these opinions, hot and heavy. And I said, they're nice, wonderful opinions, but there's only one problem. He says, what's that? And I said, God never asked you when he wrote the book. He said, well, I don't like what that says. And I don't like it. I said, he never asked you whether you liked it. Now, what are you going to do about that one? He never asked your opinion, and you don't like it. So what are you going to do? Tell God to drop dead. That's what you're going to tell him to do, right? You don't like it. Well, the problem with the Bible is it's going to tell you a lot of things you don't like. You know why? We're not that likable. Every one of us, when we look in our own heart, we know. See, we don't like to read that. We like to read those books that tell us how wonderful we are. The Bible doesn't. And people don't like it. Well, I can't help that. So uh, what I will only say, thing I can say I'm going to try to do is be as honest with you as I can. And what I'm going to tell you is what I believe to be true. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But remember something else. If I'm wrong in one part and right in the rest, the fact that I'm wrong in one does not give you a right to dismiss the rest. There's a lot of people who do that. Oh, he said this, and I don't believe that, and so therefore I don't believe anything he says. Well, that's a, that's a fool and a liar, one of the two. Uh, certainly hasn't, uh, has no discernment or judgment. There's lots of things we see, and you've got to be able to pick the wheat from the chaff. And if you can't do that, then you're going to just end up with garbage all your life, with a garbage brain full of garbage. And uh, you'll never be able to do any thinking. All right, let's just talk a bit then about... Uh, the education, as I mentioned, the education system, which is not an education system, it is an indoctrination system. And the reason why I picked this subject of evolution is one, because the subject of evolution today is core to the modern thinking. Most people today believe in life in outer space. I mean, if you really get down, they believe in life in outer space. They believe in it very sincerely. They've been given every kind of Star Wars and, and all of the books and the papers and the constant push of this stuff and the, and the missile program and everything else. We've been ballyhooing this thing for the last 25 years. You've got all of them on TV, shows and so forth, the space program, Star Trek and the others. I don't even know what they all are, but there's a pile of them. Yet, uh, <clears throat> there isn't one person in this world no matter how much he believes in life in outer space can come up with one shred of evidence for it. Not one shred of evidence. In fact, all evidence we have is that there is no life in outer space outside of this planet. All scientific evidence, scientific, dealing with the facts alone, not with our feelings, emotions, or thinking, or, or dreams, or hopes, or images that we have in our mind, but from fa actual scientific fact, all facts that we have point to no life in outer space. Remember, I didn't say there wasn't any. Watch, you see, people will say, oh, he said, when I didn't say it. I'm very careful what I say. I said all evidence points to no life in outer space. Points is the different than proving it. Proving it means that we'd have to have all evidence, and we can't have that, simply because we can't see that far. All right? We just simply, there's only so much data we have. But the data we do have does not indicate life in outer space. Now, here's a man on, on the radio one day. And they're interviewing, he's the head, uh, this is a, a professor, scientist, who's the head of an organization to collect all data on UFOs. And he has people from all over the world collecting it from the things, and the big files, massive files on so-called UFOs. And for two and a half hours, he's being interviewed, and he's very careful. And he says, remember, I said this, I did not say that. Very, very careful, precise in what he said they knew and didn't know. And after two and a half hours of the most precise Information. The, uh, the announcer or the commentator said to him, he said, uh, do you believe there's life in outer space? Now watch this most careful scientist answer. 
We have to. He was now giving you his religion. But he gave it to you as science. We have to accept it. We cannot believe that we're the only intelligible life in the universe. On what basis, Mr. Scientist? His own ego. And that's all he has. He has nothing more. He has no more than you and I have. All of our radio telescopes scanning far beyond all the optical telescopes, picking up the radio waves from the furthest parts of the galaxy have yet to pick up a single signal. Now, you mean to tell me that all this life in the space, there's nobody who knows our radio yet? Have discovered radio? That's what you would have to come up with. What do you think the Jodel Bank is there for? It isn't there to be able to search the stars. It's the search for life. And they've been there for 30 years with this thing, which is a couple blocks across, trying to find it. And they haven't found any. Oh, they'd love to find one. They'll make, they'll make one up. Don't worry about it. They'll fa fake one when they have to. You know, the smartest man, when uh, the first uh, spacewalk, now watch, I've had more people misstate what I've said here. They misstated this, and you'll probably go away and do it again. But remember, when you talk, say something to somebody else, take the credit yourself. Don't put it on me. All right? If you want to talk to somebody else, say, say it for yourself. Don't, don't say the crane said it. That's what everybody wants to do is lay it on, and you always end up twisting a little bit because it's the way you heard it. Well, it may be the way you heard it. It's the way you heard it that you say it for yourself, okay? I don't tell it my way, and you tell it your way. Here they had when their first space shot went up. And uh, or, or the, the, the guys going to the moon, you know, first space walk, I should say. And they were interviewing all these different people in New York and around the country and around the world and what their thoughts were. And they all had these wonderful thoughts about it, how wonderful this was, this, that. And the only person who gave an intelligent answer was a, appeared to sound like a very uneducated old black darky in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, he was the only guy who did any thinking whatsoever. Of this whole mass of all of these educated people, he had a thing called common sense. Now, obviously, the people who were interviewing him were laughing at him. But if you listen to what the man said, what he said was true. He might not have been sophisticated about it. He said, well, I don't know. They show me this simulator, and then they tell me what's happening. And I see this simulator, and then they tell me that all these things are happening. How do I know what is a simulator, which is not a simulator? <laughs> now, that is pretty intelligent. Nobody was out there taking these guys' picture. How did he know? They were showing that now these guys are doing this, and here we're going to take you to the simulator and show you what it is like. And they were showing them all this nice simulator. Well, that simulator was sitting in Houston. And yet all these people accepted it as being true. Was it true? I don't know. I kind of believe it was, but the fact there was no proof. And this fellow understood there was no proof. It could be a big old hoax. And finally, they made a movie about that, didn't they? Capricorn One on a hoax. And I don't think they didn't because the Sputnik was a hoax. The Russian Sputnik, we'll show you the film, uh, pictures of that tomorrow. This thing was a total hoax. The Russians never put anything up there. And I'll prove that for you tomorrow. Easy to do. All you heard is a beep, 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 and the papers told you there was something up there. Now, while we're on that, and I'll get to, as you say, we'll see the pictures and so forth of it tomorrow. While we're on that uh, thing of the Sputnik, watch something. The purpose of the Russian Sputnik was not to put a, 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 uh, a orbiter in space. Now, I'll show you why it wasn't. For 15 years, or even more, for 50 years, but particularly for the last 15 years, the establishment was trying to force upon us federal aid to education so that we could have federally controlled minds in this country. The American people had fought for 50 years federal control of their schools and had never yielded. They could Congress didn't dare pass that. Then there was a beep, 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 and the papers were full of one subject. Oh, Sputnik got a column, but the rest of it was the United States had to catch up. Russia's ahead in science. Russia, this, the United States has to catch up. We need federal aid to education. And look at every day's paper was solid. Federal aid to education. Look at every paper in this country. There wasn't one question against it. And that passed in two weeks, and nobody dared to oppose it because of a beep, 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 beep. 
which was less than $400 worth of equipment. Radio gear, that's all it took to make that beep, beep, beep. Directional radio antennas on fishing trawlers. And yet, and the, here is Von Braun standing there in Washington, D.C. when that beep, beep, beep was going and they asked him, how come the United States hasn't put up a missile? Did he say we were way behind? He said, we've been ready for 18 months and the White House has not approved the launch. They had been ready to shoot for 18 months. Why wasn't they allowed to shoot the launch? Because the Russians couldn't even get their beep, beep, beeper together. In fact, we used to make those things when we were in high school. We made them out of old junk radios for the science class. And that's back there in the 40s, kids, <laughs> back in those dark ages when we barely had light bulbs. Now, you see, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you the, how things happen. And I get to pre predicting things, just like I told uh, m uh, my brother, who one time he was saying that Russia was going to be the first to get to the moon. And I said, no, the United States will be the first to get to the moon. Well, by the way, I didn't finish what this, this fellow down in Atlanta said. And they said, well, what would it take to convince you, mister? And they were laughing at him. They were laughing at this man, who made the only intelligent comment in the whole program. He said, what would it take to convince you? Oh, he says, that's quite simple. You show me in the Bible, and I'll believe it. Of course, then they really laughed at him. That's the second, that's the most intelligent thing that they had. Now, I told my brother two years before that the United States would be the first to get to the, uh, uh, to the moon. And he said, no, no, they're going to schedule the Russians to be there. And I said, no, because they can't overthrow God. And we have an Obadiah in the fourth verse, the only place in the Bible of something from this earth being in space. Now, Obadiah is writing 700 B.C. And Obadiah says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle and make thy nest amongst the stars, I'll bring thee down, saith the Lord. Well, Russia's emblem is the bear. The United States is the eagle, right? Obadiah named the landing module. The landing module was the eagle. And those guys who named that landing module didn't know anything about Obadiah. I'll bet you there wasn't one of them that ever heard of Obadiah. But God knew all about the landing module. So thou uh, uh, so exalt thyself as an eagle and make thy nest amongst the stars, I'll bring thee down as all. And what did these men do when they stepped out of that landing module? Did they exalt themselves? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Did they exalt themselves and exalt man? It's like a mosquito going down the river and a toothpick yelling and open the drawbridge. Here they're selling and standing in the middle of God's vast universe saying, oh boy, look how great man is. And they had to get back in three days or they were dead. You talk about what a pathetic creature man is, you wonder how God could even love any of them. You see, the man was right both points, and yet the world laughed at him. Now, you can predict a lot of things. I'll give you another one, just to show you. These are predictions that I've made have come true. And one of my problems is that most predictions I make come true, not because I have any direct pipeline to any inside whammy, but merely the, the game has to be played the same way. I mean, we, these things I don't believe just happen. I believe they happen because there's something somebody wants to happen. For an example, one day I was in, and I've got some 60 witnesses in a little meeting in... Uh, on Evergreen and 10 Mile Road in Southfield, Michigan. I know where it was. I can probably bring half the people together again if you want them for a witness. And I was telling them that Martin Luther King is going to be killed soon. And it's, you know, look like this, and I was telling you why. He's not drawn audiences, and the Civil Rights Bill has now failed three times, and there's only one way to get that bill passed. He's got to die. They're going to have to kill him soon, because you cannot get anything going without a martyr. You've got to have a dead man. See, live men can't get much done. And so they're going to bump them off. And while I'm sitting there, just right then, the door opened, they said, they just shot Martin Luther King. I said, now that's calling it pretty close. That's calling it pretty close. And you see how much they've used this man? They use him more dead than alive. They use him on everything and all the time for every excuse of everything. And who can oppose it? Now notice, the Civil Rights Bill was immediately passed. 
Look at 1960, uh, what was it, 1963? Was it 63? When was it? Kennedy was shot. 63. 63. 63. I'm, my things are getting old now. My dates are all getting mixed up. Here is the Kennedy's legislation had not passed. The whole bill, all of them had failed, and they couldn't get any support. The whole liberal program was going down. And it had been all up the, and before Congress, and Congress had defeated the whole package. A bullet rings out in Dallas, and I've seen the picture. You know who shot Kennedy? When I got, uh, I've seen the, the film, and every congressman has been sent a picture of the frame, and every senator, and every judge, federal judge, has had a picture of the shooting of Kennedy. It's the driver with a 45 left-handed across his right shoulder, blows in the, uh, Kennedy's brain, blows the back of his head off. That's why the FBI captured that film immediately. The car wasn't even in sight of the bookbinding building when he was already dead, or the back of his head was blown out. See the steam puff that came out the back? This is what led this, uh, the head of ballistics of LA to say who shot him. It was because you can't get steam shooting from a bookbinding building and hit the man in the head. He's got to be hit within four to five feet. The shot had to come from in the car, and it's the driver right across the shoulder. U.S. Secret Service. Pardon? Yeah, and Jackie was trying to get out of there. <laughs> they know who did it. And I want to tell you, the people who shot Kennedy in wouldn't have much compulsion to see that Jackie had an accident necessary. But why did you shoot Kennedy? Well, I don't know. Everybody's speculated on a hundred different reasons. But I'll tell you one thing. I look at the results. What was the result of the death of Kennedy? The whole package got passed without even debate. None of the Congress dared to stand up and vote against a Kennedy bill. This is called legislation by bullet, you see. And it's a very effective program. Now here's a guy named Bobby Kennedy who tried to get back into power after his brother got bumped in. He knew who shot his brother. And he was elected president in California. When he won that primary, he had the election. There was no stopping him, except Saran Saran stopped him. He couldn't even get his coffee. And they blew him in. There is power struggles everywhere. There's power struggles in a company, isn't there? There's power struggles of who's going to be bought, who's going to get the promotion. What should make it any different that there's power struggles of bigger power in bigger places than there are in little places? There's some reason the people who are well known are somehow immune from the same avarice and greed that ordinary people have? I doubt it. Of course, you're not to believe that because they control the press. It tells you how wonderful they are, right? But remember, they are human beings with all the frailties that you have, plus one more. They have proven themselves to be as successful at their game because they're where they're at. That is, the more ruthless rise to the top, should we be surprised to find ruthless people at the top? Should that be a surprise? Hmm? Do you think that the person who really has no ambition is going to end up the President of the United States? You've got to have ambition to get there. Plus, you've got to know who to cooperate with. I mean, there are certain people who, <clears throat> uh, who simply are people you don't cross and be successful in anything. When you go to work for a large company, you know who are the people who can, when they get the nod, uh, you move up, and when you get their shake of the head, you, you don't go. I don't care what a relationship you've had. Everybody's had that, haven't they? If you haven't, you haven't been out very long. Or you're extremely naive. You wonder why you sat there for the last 20 years. <laughs> well, somebody had you sitting there for a reason. It didn't just happen. Oh, they say it just kind of happened, but it isn't. Everything has been planned. So when something happens, remember, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, if it happens, we planned it that way. Notice he didn't say, I planned it that way. He said, we planned it that way. What he says is nothing happens that we didn't want to happen. Now, I always believe if it happened, somebody wanted it to happen. All these so-called wars. 
We've now had the United Nations for peace, and we've had, what is it, 260 wars since the United Nations has been founded? We've had twice the casualties of the entire Second and First World War combined during these years of peace. Think of what would happen if we had a war. We have peacekeeping forces and we have all of these meetings. What are these meetings? I'll tell you what these meetings are. Well, we'll get that to the mouth. <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of myself. I just get enjoying some line of thought and we'll run down rabbit trails and that's all right because the total talk, I've gone 50 hours and we haven't got very far in that time so I'm just giving you ideas, just a little thing to think about, to put in that little computer and churn when you watch somebody whipping you up. You say, wait a minute, hmm. You know, everybody's got out a cause, consumer causes, uh, the uh, Hispanics people, the black people, the white people, whatever it is. Everybody's got this cause for you to join in and move with their movement. But notice, you're the people out there in that movement aren't going to get any advantage. It's those leaders who want it. They're using these people as a springboard for what they want. And everybody's got a cause to whip you into. You know what I've became? I've become a unjoiner of everything. I have just disentangled myself from all groups doing anything except the group of one, the most powerful group, the one they don't want, the individual, the person who operates on his own is the only person these people can't stand. As long as you join into something, they can lead you, speak for you, and regulate your thinking. The only person who's a dangerous to the system is the guy who says, I'm not joining nothing. I'm not playing your game. I retire. I've quit. I'm not going to work for you guys anymore. And I'm not going to give anything to you guys anymore. Now you are dangerous. Because that's the only attitude they cannot stand. That's why you have the government education system to get everybody to think in lockstep. A lockstep thinking. All right, let's go to the subject of, of uh, science for a while. Because science is now a new religion. A religion which for the last uh, 60 years has been pressed so hard that no question or any opposition has even been tolerated. Here's a friend of mine out in South Dakota who was a science teacher who was teaching evolution and creationist theories. The evidences for evolution and creation in the science classes. He got fired. He could not teach any evidence supporting creation because it was religious. Well, I want to tell you evolution is religious. It is a religion, a very powerful religion. And notice the one thing they will not do is tolerate any opposition to it. Why won't the educational system tolerate different views? Are they afraid their view won't stand up? With the, if the student has two views, he could think. And if he think, he might make a choice. And it might not be their choice. That they cannot stand. Now, notice back in the 1920s, you had the big Scopes trial. Remember down in Tennessee? Uh, the science teacher who wanted to teach evolution along with uh, the creationist theory, and the courts ruled that he had a right to teach both. But the South Dakota courts ruled that a man doesn't have the right to teach both when it comes to questioning evolutionary theory. Now, do you know why it's a theory of evolution and not the law of evolution? Do you know why it's still a theory of evolution after all of these years? They have yet to find one fact to support it. There are no facts to support it. That's why it's a theory. If they had a fact, they would jump up and down and clap their feet. Now, let's talk about science for a few minutes. I'm not against science, and you might think I am the way I'm going to be speaking, but I'm against a religion called scientism, which is quite different than science. Science is a field of study which deals entirely in facts. I want you to get my definition. Science is a field of study that deals entirely in facts. Now, next thing we have to know, watch something which I do that most people that you listen to do not do. Define my terms. If we don't have the same definition, we have two different ideas. Today, the average person cannot define a word hardly. They cannot tell you exactly what that word means and what it doesn't mean. Because that's what you have to do in order to be, have a word in your vocabulary. The average college student comes out of college today, he doesn't have a 200 word vocabulary. It used to be that he would come out with a 4,000 to 5,000 word vocabulary 50, 70 years ago. Do you know what I mean? 
They cannot define words they use all the time. They use them. But they don't have any precise meaning. And if the word doesn't have a precise meaning to both me and to you, and I use it, your idea may not be the same idea as my idea. You see? The purpose of language is to communicate precisely ideas. But if language becomes a general, it's really cool, it's really this. I listen to young people today. They can't describe a movie. They cannot describe a scene. They say, oh, it was just fantastic. It was just fabulous. Oh, it was just, oh, you should have been there. It was just, but they can't describe it. They do not have the language to describe what went on. They cannot start at the beginning and give you a, a analysis so you can get the picture of exactly what took place. They cannot do that. They do not have the gift of the facility of language. They are illiterate. And I'm talking about coming out of college. Literacy isn't a matter of being able to put a pen and make words and language. It's knowing what they mean. Now let me give you, just for an example, I'm going to give you the word truth. Now that people want to argue with this definition of truth, but, uh, <clears throat> and certainly we can make some variations on it, but I'm going to take the basic core idea of truth. People are out searching for truth, wanting to know what is true. What, uh, what is truth? You know, it's like the guy with a lantern out looking for an honest man. And supposedly this is what we're searching for in our educational endeavors, right? Searching for truth. Well, I don't think there's one in a hundred thousand people in this country can define the word. So how do they know if they found it? Now I'm going to define the word truth. Truth is an accurate representation of that under consideration as a relationship to all other things that has always been in the past, is universally in the present, and shall hold without exception in the future. Now, I've said exactly what it is and what it is not. Truth is an accurate representation. There cannot be any error in the representation. I'm speaking about something, and my, uh, my uh, analysis is exactly what is. Of that under consideration, we have to put some limit to it, right? The truth about something. And it's a relationship to all other things because everything has related to other things that cause an effectual relationship. As it always has been in the past, because if there's ever been an exception in the past, it's not really truly true. It's kind of true, maybe. More true or less true, right? But it's a relative true. But to be really true, and truth is an absolute, if it's going to be absolutely true, there can never be an exception. There can't be an exception in the entire universe right now. You don't even know what's happening down the street let alone what's happening on the moon and on the outer of stars, and can never have an exception in the future. Now, with that definition of truth, I'm going to give you a uh, definition of another word, error. Error is anything less than the truth. It's not the opposite of it. If it is not truly, truly true, it is in some part an error. All right? Notice, since you don't know hardly anything of the past, even less of the present, and nothing of the future. The fact is that you're incapable of truth at all. You see? Therefore, since you, uh, truth is impossible to you because you have a finite mind, you don't have an infinite one. You don't have one that knows all things, all times, and all places, right? You're limited by your five senses. In the light spectrum, if we had a light spectrum across this whole wall, only a small little bit of it is in, in the, in, that our optic nerves pick up. The rest of the light spectrum around into the, uh, the low frequencies and all the way through the ultraviolets is invisible to the eye. Everything that happens there, you don't know about, right? Your senses won't pick up. Did you know, for an example, that if we take an atom, the nucleus of an atom, say, as big as a uh, match head, that the nearest electron would be 150 feet away, and there's nothing in between? that almost all of an atom is nothing. <laughs> so if you took all of the material that you are made of, the electrons, protons, and neutrons, and put them all together with no space, took out the space, you would be as big as a speck of pepper, the smallest that you could see with a naked eye, if you had good eyes. And it would weigh what you weigh, because all of you would be there. That is. You got that? Your mind just went blink. You know why it went blink? So you got a computer and you only got about five digits. And, it, and when it goes over there, it has a big E. It just goes E. See, because you got a finite mind. All of a sudden it goes, boom, error. See, <laughs> you're punched in too many buttons. You cannot think of a number above five digits. You can talk about it, but you cannot picture anything over five digits in your mind. Your mind is incapable. It goes, blink, big E. 
We talk about millions of light years. What do you think? Of going 186,000 miles a second, how far one year is? You got it? No, you didn't. It just blunked out the end of your computer. It just went on overload, didn't it? You can say a light year. You can write a light year. You can make this little infinity mark, but you can't think of it. Can you think of a number so big that it's infinitely small compared to the number yet is bigger? Can you think of any number when added to itself a billion times is still the same size? No, your mind just went blink. It's called infinity, didn't it? You cannot conceive of infinity. You know why? You have a finite mind. It just went blunk. It went on overload. Therefore, truth is impossible to you. Therefore, the only thing possible to you from your little brain power is error. You are the engine of it. <laughs> I just thought we'd get all on a nice good level to start out with, see? <clears throat> all right? Now watch. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, he didn't say, I'm telling you the truth. He said, I am the truth. What was he doing? He was declaring deity. He was saying, I'm infinite. If he wasn't infinite, then that's a lie. You see the point? If he didn't know all things, then he could not say, I am the truth. And uh, people say, well, he didn't call himself God. Well, he did many other places, but he, he did it there too. Anyway, so let's get back now to science. Science deals with facts and facts only. Now let's define a fact. A fact is something that can be demonstrated. We can see it in nature or we can do it in a test tube, but we can prove it by showing it. All right? A fact is something that is demonstrable. It can be repeated, we get the same thing again. Repeated, we get the same thing again. This is called a scientific method, right? Science deals with facts. Now let's get to the next thing. An assumption. A assumption is a made up fact. When I can't get the fact I want, yet I want to get the conclusion I want, I make up a fact and stick it in as a fact, but it's called an assumption. An assumption is a made up fact. Any conclusion based on an assumption is a belief not science. Notice when the first assumption enters, science leaves. Watch this. When the first assumption enters, science leaves. True science. You now have a religious faith. The only difference is those people who purport to be given us evolution are given us a whole series of thought based on total assumption as if it was based on fact and selling it to us not as their belief in religion, but as if it was something wise and scientific. Now, I have no objection to a person giving me their beliefs. If they stand up and say, this is my beliefs, I'm a priest of this cult and I believe this, but I have no facts for it, I couldn't con condemn this man. But when he kind of stands up and says, I'm a scientist, and then makes assumptions, and bases his conclusions, he's a liar, a fraud, or an ignoramus, and you take your pick. You see? Now, let's just take a look at uh, a, a little of this science uh, that we get. Well, let's take evolution. And then I'm going to draw this into our social political context in a little while, uh, if everything works out right. One thing we get is an awful lot of uh, thing of uh, so-called missing links. In fact, every few weeks in the paper, you'll get a new one. This is supposed to be the big breakthrough Skull 1470, discovered in Kenya. Now, <clears throat> I want you to remember one thing about missing links, and this is the most important thing to remember about missing links. You ready? They're all missing. If they weren't missing links, then there would have been found links. But they've never found any links, so they only got missing links. Now, <clears throat> I want you to do a little thinking, and it might be require uh, some uh, thinking, and, and no, realize it'll be tiring. I'll try to let you go early if you think real hard. All right? This is, says the discovery in Kenya is the er earliest suggestion of uh, Genus Homo, nearly three million years old, compels a rethinking of man's pedigree. Three million years old. Now, there it is. Now, this is in National Geographic, the source of all wisdom and truth. <clears throat> now, tell me, where did they come up with that three million years? Well, if you write 3,000, you add one more zero, you get 30,000. Two more, you get 300,000. Another zero only gives you uh, 3 million. I mean, what's a zero? Zero is nothing. Putting another one on the end of there doesn't hurt at all, does it? 
It makes a good story better. And I want to tell you that's the only way they ever arrived at that three million. There is no way to come up with three million years or 300,000 years or 30,000 years or 3,000 years or 300 years or 30 years or three years. There is no scientific way to date that skull. They dated it by their belief. Oh, you say carbon-14. Well, that's what Papa did. Papa used carbon-14. What did got going here, a band on the street? <laughs> so, somebody's picking something up on an FM. Okay. Oh. Okay. Now, here, carbon-14. And I had that argument over here in Ohio State. I think somebody was here in Ohio State University 10 years ago, and I was debating this with uh, some of the members of the science faculty at Ohio State. And they, were, they dated this skull some 300, 400,000 years, and this one here, 3 million years by carbon-14 and potassium argon dating. Now, let me tell you something about uh, carbon-14. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,000 years, give or take a little bit. They all argue over how much give or take, but it's all within 100 years, so we wouldn't want, that, that's nothing to these guys. You know, 100 years means nothing. We're talking millions, right? Now, does everybody here know what a half-life is? Sure you do. All right. Well, you're going to know now. You ready? There's another thing to throw in your little old bag so when you read these guys. <clears throat> all forms of energy, whether it be a spinning top, a thrown ball, a rifle bullet, or heat or anything, we have a, a, what is called a period of time in which half of that energy is dissipated, such as uh, you same thing with radioactive material. We have it, and there's a certain period of time that half of it will have radiated away and become inert. Theoretically, or this is what they say is true, and I have no way to know whether it is or not, but I'll accept their data because I'm going to pin them on their own facts, <coughs> quote facts, that the same period of time, another half will be gone, and the same period of time, another half will be gone, and the same period of time, another half will be gone, and of course, what you have is a never-ending process, right? Where it continues to reduce. The same thing is the uh, same with the rotational spin of the Earth. It's supposed to be 50,000 years. That means if the world was here 50,000 years ago, it was spinning twice as fast as it is today, a day with 12 hours long. And if it's here 50,000 years from now, we'll have a 48-hour day, all right? because it's, just, it's slowing down. Every body in mo movement is in the process of slowing down. Now, 50,000 years is supposedly the half-life of the rotational spin of the Earth. Now, they've got a little problem with this fact that they have, and they say that they've got this well-established at 50,000 years. If that's the case, how do they get a three million-year-old skull? Now, I'm going to show you a problem they got. This is only one of them. 100,000 years ago, this world would be spinning four times as fast. 150,000 years ago, eight times as fast. 200,000 years ago, 16 times as fast, and there is no Earth. Because if this Earth is spinning 16 times as fast as it's spinning now, it flies off because it's escape velocity into space. There is no Earth. Now, how do you get a 3 million year old man on an Earth that cannot be 200,000 years old? Well, that doesn't bother these people, see? I'll give you another little problem they got. Now, these are problems. The magnetic field of our Earth has a half-life of 1,400 years. That is, the electrical output of the generator in the center of our Earth was twice as strong 1,400 years ago, or approximately 5 or 600 A.D. Four times as strong at 800 B.C. Eight times as strong, uh, whatever it comes out to, uh, 2,200, is it, B.C.? And the problem is, that if you project that increase in the magnetic field back for 20,000 years, the electrical output passing over this Earth's surface as an electrical output over any conductor, when it gets strong enough, it heats up. And the Earth would be white hot 20,000 years ago. White hot Earths do not have 3 million year old skulls on them. Let's take a look at another. These are scientific facts. These are facts. Not a skull out there that somebody says, hmm, I think three million years. Let's take a look at the next fact. We have a, uh, uh, which one, I just had it there? What? Well, not the other end. Well, that's the way it goes. Uh, sometimes. Well, let's get back to our carbon-14. Carbon-14 has a half-life of only 5,000 years. They go out, 
And by the way, when we get to three half-lives, there's not enough carbon-14 left to measure. Or, or we should say that. We have no instruments that can measure it. We're talking about parts per trillion. And man has no instruments to measure parts per trillion of carbon-14. All right? 15,000 years is the outside limit of carbon-14 dating. Yet these guys will date a skull at 3 million years old by carbon-14. How'd they do it? They lied. They ought to use potassium argon. If Papa Leakey used potassium argon in one of his vines. We have potassium argon dating at 50,000 years on, uh, on materials that came out of a volcano only five years ago, known to be only five years old in Hawaii. Now, that's not a very good dating system, is it? That's got an error factor like that. Yet they'll use potassium argon. Why? It's the best they got. They have nothing better. If they had something better, they'd use it, wouldn't they? Well, let's look at, at our skull 1470. I don't want you to notice some things that we get in our education. Maybe we're going to cut a couple of those lights, those spots back there. So, uh, is there switches around here, anything? that uh, Somebody can command the environmental conditions here? What we see here is a picture of skull 1470, which is supposed to be the greatest find of our ancestors. Uh, there should be, well, those spots back there is our trouble. I think they're just plugged in down here, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, notice that this skull is made out of blue clay, which was made in 1974. Uh, the white bone scrapings were glued on. But the shape of that clay was made up by the man who molded it, and it was not God, and it was not three million years ago. So I want you to see what they have found and, and what I got in front of that speaker. I got to be careful of that. Uh, one of the things you do with a speaker is you turn it out. Just turn it out. It sounds better. It bounces off back walls and doesn't get near the thing. Now, look, watch what they do. They take these bone scrapings and they add a jaw. Where did the jaw come from? They made that up too. Now, once they got the jaw, they're going to put muscles and eyeballs on there. You see there? That's called fleshing out. All they had was bone scrapings. Remember what they started with, bone scrapings. Now they got this, the nostrils. You see those no nostrils on the bone scraping? There was no nostrils. Those eyes, those ears, the lips. Where did they come on the bone scraping? They didn't even have a jaw even in the clay. And here they end up with a finished product. Tell me, how much of that product is imagination and how much of that product is science? Even if the bone scrapings were legitimate. But you're told, you're shown these pictures, and everybody says, oh, look at that. That's done so well. It looks like a picture, doesn't it? It looks like a photograph. You think you're looking at real scientific proof when you're looking at nothing better than Dick Tracy. It's, 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 it's strict. And yet, we, we buy this stuff as if it is true and talk to people about it as if it's a fact, don't we? There is no fact there at all. Do you see that? Is there anybody having a problem to see what I'm talking about? You go through National Geographic and every article will have millions of years in it. Billions. The whole purpose of that is the most beautiful pictures, the most beautiful printing on the best possible paper are the biggest lies ever told in the history of the world. Now, I want to show you. Here we flesh out. This is, uh, 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 which one was it? Pictarus? Yeah, Pictarus, man. We got that skull. We flesh him out, and we come up with a Russian delegate to the 1958 Cairo Conference. <laughs> Does that make that skull millions of years old? Here, if we go and take Cro-Magnon man's skull, we find that Charles Darwin had a perfect one. How many million years old is Charles Darwin? One of the inventors of this absolute, uh, this stupid folly. Here we have a man named Lafayette, perfect Neanderthal.
Here's a Xanthus man, and here's three different drawings. One in the Sunday Times, another one in a, in a, a textbook, and another one for the National Geographic. It looks like George Saunders down here. But anyway, this is the same bones. Look, uh, can you tell me how much science there is when the bones give you that much difference in the pictures? Here's another rendering of the same bones. Anything you want, we make it up. Now, you see, they come up with <coughs> little things like this. You go out in the graveyard. See, and I'll show you how these guys are going to work. They go out in the graveyard, and they start pick, they dig up. They've got a bunch of bones here. They pick up a skull with a big brain pan, modern man. <coughs> big brain pan. That's the size of the brain cavity. Oh, modern man. Small brain cavity. Oh, we got an ancient man. Big brain pan, modern man. Small brain pan, old man. You know, millions of years old. Smaller the brain pan, the more million years old he is. Why? They assume evolution. They assume that earlier ages we had smaller brain pans and that we are the greatest thing that ever came down the pike. Did you know that? Well, I want to tell you, Adam, it was, it was the greatest man ever was because we're all degenerated from him. And that's scientifically true. We'll get into that maybe a little later. But anyway, the point is this. We can go out with every so-called skull that they've ever found and we'll find people with brain pans walking around the day exactly like them. The brain pans they find are between 900 and 1,500 cubic centimeters, and brain pans on people walking around today are between 900 and 1,500 cubic centimeters. They haven't found anything different than what we find people walking around. Uh, there used to be a fellow, really quite a, a real nice fellow named Charlie Brown, but he looked just like the pictures of Neanderthal man. He worked with my wife in an office. Very nice fellow. But he used to come in, he said, you don't believe in evolution? Here I am! <laughs> You know? <laughs> but this, this, is, this is absurd. What we have is man, and man comes in many varieties. God made him in all sorts of varieties. It would be terrible if he didn't. We couldn't tell who was who. We wouldn't know whose wife we were going home with. Anyway, <clears throat> now, they start out drawing some pictures of different skulls, 1470 Homo habilis, which is an interesting thing. This one is supposed to be this one's grandfather, but he is a million years younger. Well, it does make any difference for those people, see? And we come up here to the present Homo sapien. They just stick these names on there. But the problem is that none of these things are, are new. Uh, here we're supposed to have Cro-Magnon man. Now watch here. This is in the 1966 World Book Encyclopedia. Now if we want to know truth, where do we go? The Bible? No, we go to the encyclopedia. Now there's where, and remember, whoever wrote the book of truth is God, right? You understand? Whoever is your source of your truth is your God. Whatever you turn to for your truth is for you a deity. At first, scientists thought Neanderthal man was a squat, stooping, brutish, somewhat ape-like creature. But later research showed him the bodies of Neanderthal men and women were completely human, fully erect, and very muscular. Their brains were as large as those of modern man. They were modern man and are modern man. In fact, they've been reclassified as modern man. Now, while admitting this such to be the case in the same book, the World Book Encyclopedia, 1966, under a different heading, they picture the Neanderthal family depicting a squat, stupid, brutish, somewhat ape-like creature. Now, you say, well, maybe they didn't get time to change it. This is 1981, and if you want to pick up the textbooks used in the schools today, they'll be still be showing. Uh, um, what's this one down there? Java Man, for example. We'll get to him in a minute. Uh, uh, Piltdown Man. Now, Piltdown Man has been now reclassified as a hoax. It seems that some college students got a chimpanzee and worked him over with a little iron acid in a file and buried him for their profit to find. So, Piltdown Man has been reclassified as a hoax. Neanderthal Man has been reclassified as a modern Homo sapien. All right? Uh, let's see what else. James Anthrop's Man is now a hoax. Uh, the, oh, they had a real good Africanist man. And then this man, they found. While walking down a trail, this guy falls over, Leaky's papa, falls over this human cranium sc uh, skull plate in the middle of a path, a million and a half years old. Now that's fabulous to have in a jungle a skull plate last a million and a half years. It's absolutely fabulous. Well, he tripped over the thing. Anyway, the British Museum had it for decades. And they build a whole man out of a round skull plate, the top of the head bone, supposedly. After some 20 or 30 years, some guy comes along and he says, wait a minute, you fellas, you made a mistake. What? That's an elephant's kneecap, which is what it proved to be. 
Now, I want to tell you this. Any science that cannot tell the difference between an elephant's kneecap and a human cranium is pretty weak. We have Nebraska man made out of a single tooth. And they got this whole thing in your books of a Nebraska man made out of a one tooth. Now, do you imagine how much imagination I had to take to build a man out of a tooth? I mean, God took a whole rib out of Eva, uh, out of Adam. And later, the tooth has been reclassified as a pig's tooth. Yet they still got Nebraska man in the textbooks based on a pig's tooth. Do you know why they're using that evidence? It's the best they got. I want to re reiterate that. It's the best they got. Look, if they had anything better, they'd use it. There's Neanderthal man in the field museum. Now, the field museum is interesting. Down in the basement, they used to have all of these little things, and they'd have uh, little uh, uh, displays where they had campfires and spo supposedly uh, the setup of different of our missing links, the whole series of those cases. Have any of you seen those showcases, field museum? They've now removed them. The field museum finally got honest enough to admit there is no scientific evidence for any of them, and they refuse to show them any longer. They've been there for decades since I was a little kid. Before then, there's Neanderthal man with a hat on. Here's Piltdown man. This part was out of a chimpanzee, and this part is out of plaster. There's Piltdown man, nicely finished up. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? There's Java man, four teeth an ape bone and a human skull plate found 60 feet apart in a gravel bed in Java. How do you find them 60 feet apart in a gravel bed, knowing they're, uh, know they're from the same creature? He goes out there in a gravel bed, he finds four teeth, he finds a cranial plate, and he finds a bone. He says, ha, missing link. We found the missing link. One and a half million years old. They bring this thing back, and he makes plaster casts, and he sends them out to the universities of the world. This is in the early part of this century. And on the basis of a plaster cast, the great academies declared it one of the great finds. They never saw the bones. He never showed anybody the bones. He only sent them plaster cast. After the Second World War, because these were locked up in his place in Vienna, they, some men went in and unlocked these bones, looked at them, and locked them back up. And the only thing I know about it is the remark they were not like the plaster cast. The guy fudged the cast. Now we get some interesting things when we get down to missing links. Here's William Meister. Uh, he's an oil prospector. He was an oil prospector for uh, one of the oil companies out west with oil shale. And he comes in one night with his bag of rocks that he's been out picking up samples. And he breaks this rock open. Now this is a rock he broke open. And in the middle of the rock, he finds a human footprint with a shoe on stepping on a trilobite. Now, trilobites were supposed to have disappeared some 100,000 years ago before man ever appeared on the earth. But there's a trilobite. Stepped on and see the shoe and see the heel? You don't get that line in nature. See, this is a, the cast of that. There's a trilobite blown up. Now, the biggest trilobite ever seen, and we've seen billions of them because they're the most common practically thing in the fossil record is trilobites. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest ever seen was two inches. Here's a fossilized trilobite. There's millions of them. Now watch what happened. He takes it to the University of Utah, and they did the right thing. They refused to look at it. He went to two more universities to try to show them his human footprint in the middle of a rock stepping on a trilobite. And they refused to look at it. Finally, he got one school to look at it. And then after it came out, this thing, the, Dr. Jennings, the head of the University of Utah's anthropology department, theorized that the outline, which appeared to be a sandal print, might be the outline of a very large trilobite, which had crushed and fossilized along with smaller trilobites. A very large trilobite that looks like a human footprint with no ribs in it, some 12, 14 inches long, stepping on a trilobite, which is a normal sized trilobite. And now of the billions of trilobites, we've never seen one over two inches long. Where did he come up with that theory? He had to. What else? His religion, you see, is what de determines his thinking. And so does yours. Now, for a long time, I think I got this kind of backward a little bit. Yeah, this is a fossilized fish, which is supposed to be your great-great-granddaddy back there a few hundred thousand years ago when it come out of the ooze and he, his first creature came up on land. 
And they have found this fossil, and this was one of the great finds to prove evolution to be true. That this thing, millions of years old, was your great, great, great granddaddy. In 1937, a guy fishing at 10,000 feet down with a basket brought one up. Not millions of years old. He was living when he caught him. He wasn't living when he got him up because of the pressure, of course. But there's one. The turtles have not evolved. The mollusks are the same. We find billions and billions of star creatures, and they're exactly the same as the modern ones. Here's a leaf. What do you know about that leaf? What's interesting about that leaf? That's a fossilized leaf. It's green. Chlorophyll, and how long does it take a leaf when it's been picked to uh, lose its green? See how fast that thing was encased? That was no millions of years. <laughs> you see, on one side here we have fossilized, fossilized starfish, and the other side we have modern ones. No difference. What happened to the evolution? Here's a fly encased in amber, a fly trapped in amber. Now, do you know how many generations a fly has a year? Do you know how many generations per century in a fly? If we're going to see evolution, how much evolution we got to have between that fly and the modern flies? Do you see evolution taking place? No. There's a fossilized grape leaf, and there's a grape leaf picked right off the tree. Same. Here's an interesting one. <clears throat> now, one of these things that these people theorize, huh, is they say this. But you see, we know how old something is by how far down we dig to find it. One inch is a thousand years. So if we dig 10 inches and find it 10 inches, 10,000 years old. If we find it two feet, it's 24,000 years old. And so they dig away and they just multiply by their nice thousand uh, years per, foot, uh, per inch. Isn't that nice? Now that's very scientific. Well, they say it's a little rough, but it's a close estimate. Therefore, we can tell how old something is by how far down we dig. Now, that would be, sound nice if you went to school and that's all you were taught in your indoctrination machine, but let's do something called thinking. If we're going to bury, how do we bury all the earth one inch every thousand years? To bury one place an inch, we have to unbury someplace else. You see the point? Are you catching on now? You can't bury the whole earth one inch every thousand years. You must be unburying someplace if you're burying someplace else. The dirt must come from one place to go to another place, right? Okay? How do we know that it isn't uh, much, much older? Because this area, instead of being buried, has been being unburied. You see what I'm saying? The dating process doesn't work. How do you go and dig down and find an age of anything? You simply, you can't. Because it isn't true. Anything buried has got to be unburied someplace else. Now. This pine spore was found 5,000 feet down. Now, if you will multiply 5,000 feet times 12 inches, right? That's 60,000 times 1,000, which is 60 million years old. And that pine spore has not evolved. Modern pine spores are just like this pine spore. And according to their little statistics, they say we got a 60 million year old pine spore and no evolution. Well, it's not 60 million years old, by the way. Here we have some interesting things. According to the theory of one inch digging down, gives you a thousand years, how are you going to explain this is a tree trunk? This tree, this is one meter in this one. We have a tree trunk 70 feet high in lime stone. And we have these trees. Now, here this tree stood here for, now just, just this part here, you see, at 39 inches or 39,000 years, that tree stood there when it was buried here. And of course, it's already been standing here a thousand years for each one of these inches. And it stood there all the time and never rotted or fall, fell down, which is a very interesting thing if you know anything about trees. How about a reed four and a half feet high? 50,000 years it stood there and the pith is still in the reed and never fell down and never rotted? You see, these things are absurdities. Why do they come up with the absurdity? It's the best they got. Now. Let's take a look. What do you see here? <coughs> what do you see there? For scientific observation. Yeah. What? Yeah, they're fossilized fish. They're fossilized fish, and that's a fact. 
we have two fossilized fish. Now, what can we tell about these fossilized fish by looking at them? Is there anything anybody here can observe about these fossilized fish? Yeah. All the flesh is on it. Yeah. Aha, very good. They were encased in this stone while swimming and fighting. They were not dead. Their backs are arched, their fins are out. They're not belly up, they're not curled in. These fish were fighting and alive while encased. And they were totally encased while fighting and alive, not over a million years. Now what's the important point about this? What happens when your local fish goes, has his heart attack in your pond out back? What happens to him? What happens to a fish when he dies? No, he doesn't. We think of that because that's the way we see him. But that isn't what happens when he dies. What happens to the fish when he has his coronary? Before that, probably something else ate him. But if he doesn't get eaten before he gets to the bottom, because that's the direction he goes, there will be crabs and all sorts of wiggly things in the bottom that live off of eating off of dead things, scavengers, the garbage hunters. If he's down there three days or more, depending on the temperature of the water, then gas will start forming as he starts decaying. And as the gas cells expand, he will now come to the top. Boop. That's when you see him. You only see one in a billion of them because most of them got eaten before they ever got to the top. All right? Now, when he gets to the top, what happens? Birds and things, surface feeders eat on them. If he doesn't get eaten by now, which almost all have been by now, very few would survive, or, or survive, if you call the dead fish surviving. But anyway, uh, if he, he eventually get to a shore. What happens when he gets to a shore? There's maggots and ants and vultures, and we got all sorts of wonderful things just waiting to eat them up. All right? When everything dies in this world, it becomes a meal for something else. If you go out and die in the trail out here and nobody should find you for a while, you do not become a fossil and neither does the fish. You become a meal. Things are going to eat on you, as Shakespeare said in Hamlet, the first, second act. The emperors, are, uh, the worm is our only emperor. Right? He'll have us all for dinner. Now, we don't like to think of those things, do we? Huh? We want to buy big lead caskets and big co concrete vaults. It's going to make a difference anyway, right, when it all gets done. Now, the thing is that in the fossil record, where we have trillions and trillions of fossils, there's one thing very interesting about them. They weren't buried in an inch per thousand years when we got alligators with the uh, excrement still intact. When we got uh, squid with the ink sac still in perfect tank. When we got mastodons, mastodons of which you can still eat the meat. Those things didn't get frozen over a thousand years. It was whammo now. You go out and freeze a steak and freeze it slowly and you see what you got, you're gonna drink the thing when you thaw it out. Mastodon frozen all the way through with daisies in his stomach meant that he was frozen through to his stomach within 20 minutes of eating daisies in a hot climate. You figure that one out? Took me years, I finally figured it out, and if sometime anybody wants to ask me, I'll tell you how that happened, if you got Mastodon uh, uh, curiosity. And it didn't happen as this guy uh, writing in the ice epic thing said. That's a bunch of garbage. But anyway, <clears throat> the thing about all these fossils is this, nothing's eaten on them. Why haven't they been eaten on? Like all things die, get eaten on. How come the fossils weren't eaten on? The thing that normally eats them was also becoming a fossil. Whatever happened, happened all at once. And it just packed in millions of these things, 5,000 feet deep or whatever distance you want. But there wasn't, this was not spread over a period of time. This is not the normal course of history. It is not what we see day to day. It is an abnormal situation, all right? Now, let's take bat ratology. <clears throat> now, this is out of a standard textbook. We start out with a rat and it evolves into a bat. Well, we know that can't be true because Darwin told us that can't be true. Do you know why? 
Darwin says survival of the fittest. When we get a bat rat over here, we got something that can't fly and can't forage. It's going to starve out. It's the worst of two possible worlds, bat and ratism. Now, let's take a look at the next situation of bat ratism. If bat rats evolved into bats, why aren't present rats evolving into bats? Why aren't bats evolving into super bats? Why are they happy to stay bats? And where are the sub rats that are evolving into rats? Now notice something. We don't have 12 stages as pictured here between rat and batism. But every mutation, and we're talking about a more mutations than there are atoms in the entire universe necessary to change the 180,000 enzymes per single cell, which is there necessary for the production of all RNA, which produces all our DNA, which produce the enzymes all in the single cell. We're talking about every single change being a mutation, and every mutation is technically a new creature. To evolve from one to the other isn't all of a sudden, bang, here's a rat decided to be a bat. You're talking about a million stages of bat ratism, or degrees of bat ratism, trillions of stages of bat ratism. You get this? Now the next thing is you have to have as many at each stage of bat ratism as you got rats or bats. Therefore, we should have trillions and trillions of more bat rats than rats or bats. In fact, we shouldn't have any bats or any rats. All rats should be working on the batism, and all bats should be going on to super batism. Why is it that we have rats and bats? Simple. There's no evolution going on. If evolution is going on, you've got to have bat rats now. Not only that, we've got to have every missing link between every creature now. Now I'm going to get up to another sub uh, subject. And as I say, I don't want to be delicate. I like to be blunt. And some people don't like that. I'm uh, sorry. I can't have it. Now, the Bible says all creatures are have after their own kind. Rats don't have bats, and bats don't have rats. If I gave you an egg, how could you tell me what kind of egg it is? I give you a nice little blue egg. It's about an inch and a half across, and it's got little speckles on it. How can you tell what kind of egg that is? Anybody here could tell me how to find out what kind of egg that is? Ah, hatchet. Hatchet is the best way. In fact, it's the only way to be sure what that egg is. Now, I want to tell you, if a robin comes out of that egg, what is the chances that the parents are robins? I've never seen the parents, but what are the chances that the parents are robins? Well, now, evolution true, it could have been a goose. You see, there could be a couple of goose. Now, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I listened to a TV program one time, it went on for about an hour, asking people all over the world which came first, the chicken or the egg, and I sat there and I said, boy, how stupid, not one of them had the brilliance to be able to figure out you can't have a chicken or a egg. You better have two. Obviously, it couldn't evolve. <laughs> How are you accidentally going to have one chicken and, an, and, and, and a rooster accidentally pop up here <laughs> by evolution? An absurdity, isn't it? Do you realize how many mutations you have to have to get one horse? You would have to have more horse ancestors, 5,000 times more horse ancestors than there are atoms in the whole universe, known universe. That's a lot of horse ancestors. How did that horse evolve a hoof in every corner? How did no evolve an eye on one side and then evolve an eye on the other side? You heard him tell you about the vestigial organs that you have, those organs that aren't needed are being passed the way that were needed by your ancestors back in the cave, like the little red part in the middle of your eye here, which used to be your fish eye. And you have some tonsils, which are an appendix. Appendix. Isn't that a nice word for it? Appendix. Something you don't need. Just hung in there. It used to be when we were, we were eating raw meat, we needed those appendix. And now those intestines, we don't need as much. You've heard that garbage, haven't you? Taught when I was in school, and I'm sure still taught now. Your appendix, what is it? Is it a loop of intestines that's no longer needed like they teach? No, it isn't. It's lymph glands. And what do the lymph glands do? The lymph system takes the poisons out of all the cells of your body through the lymph ducts down to the lymph glands and puts it in, the poisons into your intestines to have it go out with a draught. It is the cleanser of the entire cellular system of the body. Are you telling me you don't need it? What about your tonsils? They're lymph glands. They take all of that out of your 
your head and put it into the throat so it can go down the, into the stomach, be eaten up by the acids and be destroyed, the poisons, you see. The tonsils were not something left over. What about that little red part here, that fish eye here in the middle? Now that, you take that red part out of there and you're gonna find out you get very cold in the back of your eyeballs. That's not a fish eye, it's just necessary to make a nice good seal. There is no part of the body that you have that is a vestigial organ left over from the time in which we were living in caves. Do you know what they want to teach us? And this is right in De Viries. Do you know why we don't have tails? One of our grandpappies was swinging from one tree to another and he swang too hard. And that's the reason why men don't have tails. <laughs> now I want to tell you something. If you go out and take an ape and chop his tail off, is he going to have tailless uh, children? I have one eye. I have two children. Both of them have two eyes. There are one-armed men. Do you realize this? Who have children with two arms? Yet they teach that. Why do they teach it? Because they teach what happens to the creature. The environment, and this is where we're going to get the environmental and sociological impact of this, that your environment forms you. No, it doesn't. Neither sociologically, legally, politically, or morally. This idea is she the day. That, after all, we have all sorts of cripples. Not just our cripples with arms, but social cripples, economic cripples, political cripples. Here's a guy, he's caught for murdering somebody. Well, you know why he did it? Well, he was born poor. Or he was born rich with a silver spoon in his mouth. Or his mother was too kind to him. Or his mother beat him. Uh, uh, because he was black. Or because he was a white wasp. They'll come up with any reason, except one reason. He killed a guy. The responsibility's not his, it's somebody else's. You notice the whole theory today is always somebody else's fault. You see? We're a product of our environment. You're not a product of your environment. You're a product of your very nature. But anyway, let's, this bat ratism, this thing is a mathematical absurdity, and yet it's taught. Here's a fossilized bat. Looks just like modern bats. Can't tell one from another. Can you think of the common ancestors of all these creatures? What it would look like? We can throw in some more wines. We can throw a chicken in there and a few other things and try to come up with a common ancestor of it. Were there dinosaurs? Yes, I've been out in dinosaur pits and seen them. Well, where are the dinosaurs today? They're dead. Simple. Does that prove evolution? No, it proves the opposite. Over half the creatures that once lived in this world are now extinct. Notice these people who talk about evolution are always out there trying to fight to protect endangered species. Wait a minute, if evolution is true, we should be getting more and more and more species every day. We shouldn't have to worry about endangered species, but an overflood of species. But instead, the number of species are decreasing by two per year. Now, we're taking in all nine phyla here. We're talking about all the little worms and the bugs and all of the, <laughs> the little weeds and all of the other stuff and the grubs and everything else. We throw them all together. We're losing two species a year. There are some uh, eight or 9,000 proven mis uh, or extinct species, yet we've never seen a new one come into existence. The number of species in the Earth is constantly decreasing, not increasing as evolution would have us to believe. Now notice, all the facts indicate against it. What happened to dinosaurs? A dinosaur couldn't live, these creatures couldn't live today. Do you know why? They're vegetarians. With that kind of bulk, they could not, with those small mouths, eat enough vegetable, uh, veg uh, uh, vegetation in our atmosphere with our oxygen levels that we have today and survive. They'd starve to death. They became extinct. Well, everything else became extinct became because it couldn't survive. Somebody said, it's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the luckiest. Uh, well, let's take a look and see what the Bible says. The Bible says something very interesting, that men are to subdue the earth, that the creatures of the earth are to be subdued by men. According to the Bible, the world started out with uh, lots of all different kinds of animals and two people. And the course of history would be for people to multiply and become more populous and to take over the earth and subdue the animals, and the animals would decline. Well, that's what we've seen. 
Now, let's take a look about kinds. The Bible says that each shall have after their own kind. How can we, how can we find out what is the same kind? How are they classified by the scientists, by kinds? Is a fox a dog? Is a wolf a dog? Right. How many say a fox is a dog? Everybody's got to vote now. Everybody vote. We're all friends here, right? How many say a fox is a dog? How many say a fox is not a dog? How many, how, is it, how many say a wolf is a dog? How many say a wolf is not a dog? All right. Most of you voted wrong. <laughs> a wolf is a dog. A fox is not a dog. Now, how do we know that a wolf is a dog and a fox is not a dog? That's the next question. How do we know? If we take a wolf and a dog and put them together, they have puppies. If we put a fox and a dog together, they don't have puppies. That tells us that a wolf is a dog and a fox is not a dog. Can they have puppies? Isn't that simple? After their own kind. Why can't fox have, a dog, uh, have puppies with a dog? Because a fox is not a dog. Isn't that simple? Is a, a donkey an equestrian? That's a horse. Yep. If we put a horse and a donkey together, do we get an offspring? Yep. But we get a mule. But the mule has some problems. <clears throat> Mules generally don't have any offspring. Sometimes they do. Rarely. A female mule might have. But if a female mule has a, if the, the uh, uh, colt's father is a horse, it'll be, the offspring will be all horse. And if the, uh, the, uh, the father of this uh, mule's colt is a donkey, because it can't be a mule. There's never been a fertile male mule, so you can't do that one, right? A donkey, you have a mule, which tells us that in the certain cases, in rare cases, that we have female mules that reproductive organs are horse. And in that case, they can reproduce. But notice something. After we've crossed millions and millions of donkeys with millions and millions of horse, we have never got a new species. Mules do not continue except as we continue to make them. And there is no new species mule, and they're both even in the same family. You can cross a wheat with an oat and get a wheat oat. But all the female wheat oat are, uh, are sterile, and the male are rare, uh, 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 the other way around. Male is. And if you cross the wheat oat with an oat, you get something that looks like an oat. If you cross it with a wheat, you get something that looks like a wheat. And if you cross them again with a wheat, you're going to get something that's absolutely a wheat. The thing is, God has put up some definite walls and lines, and in nature, we never see those lines over, overthrown. Or we're going to get some doctors that'll sit and bastardize something. You know, they're going to create some monsters. But that isn't called proven evolution, or even the possibility of evolution. To do this, we must see it in nature. You see the point? Now they're going to say, oh, we've seen it in an enzyme. We have seen down here in a micro something or other. Wait a minute, we're not talking about an exception. In order for evolution to be true, it must be universal in all life forms and obvious to everybody. Because of the fact we do not have kinds and species, but an infinite variety of life with no definite lines between them at all. You see the requirement of evolution, biological evolution? I don't know whether you're following me, but Down here, I have a friend who lives right out back here, running for 400 miles in Texas from uh, Glen Falls in the north down through Marble Falls and down about another 100 miles south of there is the Biloxi River. Now, the Biloxi River most of the year doesn't have any water in it. When it does, it has a big old whomper that comes down there and so forth. But down the Biloxi River has some interesting things. It has feet prints in the stone underneath the gravel bed. You dig it up in certain places when the river comes through and washes off, and there's all these foot footprints. The footprints are of several different kinds, but the ones we're interested in is one, reptiles. Now, as you can see, that's a pretty good-sized little old reptile walking on there. Three toes are reptiles, in case you haven't figured that one out, all right? That's a good old big old lizard whomping along like a dinosaur. And here, walking along with them, are peoples. 
Those are human footprints. And this is a normal man size 14. Take a look at those footprints. Now that guy had a big understanding. We have four men in this country whose feet will fit that, and they're all over nine feet tall. The Bible says there were giants in the earth. But anyway, we got some pretty big old footprints, human footprints, plopping along for 400 miles of this stuff, you know. <laughs> These are, uh, now, what does the scientific community say about that? Seeing dinosaurs were supposed to have disappeared way back in here, and man didn't appear up into here under the, the scale. Well, they have a simple answer to this. They ignore it totally. You will find nothing in your textbook about 400 miles of Biloxi Riverbed. Thousands upon thousands. These footprints have been, they've been selling them back before the First World War. They were selling them to the tourists. They have finally, the government had to stop that and preserve them. Think of evolving this wing. Think of how this creature evolved that wing. Did he evolve it in a day? How did he fly without all of it? You know what happens if he doesn't have those two feathers? Those two feathers? He can't fly. How does that creature live and not get eaten up walking around the ground with half-grown feathers that he can't do? I have two macaws at home. Man, when they get on the ground, they're absolutely hopeless. Just waddling along. They can't do nothing. Yeah. You know, when I was a boy, I used to have, seeing I have one eye, I rather than waste the money on binoculars, I bought a monocular. That way I can buy twice as much power for the same money. And <clears throat> I sit in my bedroom window and I'd be looking at this moon. Now, this is before any of us went around tramping around up there. But anyway, I said, wait a minute, that moon is very young. Because you see 24 million meteorites strike our upper atmosphere every day on this earth. And 6 million meteorites a day strike the moon. 6 million. But in the case of our earth, our atmosphere burns almost all of them up. And they do not come down bamming into our earth, busting things up. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult living here with all of these years with these missiles coming through at us at the speed of light or whatever they're running around up there at. Now, the trouble with the moon is it is not hot or liquid in the center. It is a cold, solid mass with no volcanic action. It has no atmosphere. It has no hydrosphere, no water. It has no wind. It has... It is basically dead outside of the heating and the cooling as it, goes, uh, as it has its 29-day uh, day, day. But outside of that, there is no weather on the moon. Now, this causes a problem. If a meteorite strikes a rock and chips off a little piece, there is nothing there to re-solidify it. See, rocks are being made in our world all the time by water action, but not there. There, the, the planet would be bombarded by this constant bombardment of meteorites, would be worn very quickly into a ball of about 50 feet deep of solid dust, about the con uh, consistency of confectioner's sugar. This is what Scientific America was saying in the 30s and the 40s. And yet, if you look at the moon, you got 14,000 foot high mountains, rugged rocks sitting there under this bombardment. This is why when those guys landed in the, in the Eagle, they were, that Armstrong was so uh, timid about getting off, he was supposed to go into 50 feet of dust. And he got off and he said, it's only a half inch deep. They just lost their billions of years. The ruggedness of the terrain of the moon proves one thing. It's very young. Because the rocks and mountains cannot be reformed, as they can on the Earth by volcanic action, by upthrust, by water, hydraulics, by the lime and settling and so forth. All of these things cause uh, changes in our Earth service, but not on the moon. Just looking here, you see the meteorite strikings, you see, in this piece of uh, moon rock. That stuff costs about $2 billion a pound. Some pictures there on the moon of the surface. You can see the time. I'm out here, and uh, uh, in... My brother loaned me his uh, big bus he had uh, for a month, trip out through the west. And we got up here in the uh, Yellowstone. Uh, and I get here, and this is the Mammoth Fountain. Now, every time you get out west or any place, and you're looking across a beautiful view, the government has put this nice big map and a big sign there and a nice stone for you to read 
about how many millions and billions of years old this, 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 and this, this, and this, this is. Every plaque has millions and billions of years on it. Every plaque. You're to believe that, you see. And it's important to them. They spent a lot of money to do that. Well, here they had a brochure, and I picked the brochure up, and the brochure says that a half a ton of lime a day is coming up. A half a ton of lime a day. And I say, how big is this thing? Look, it's maybe uh, 30 feet, 25 feet high, and maybe it's uh, 80 feet across. All right. How long does it take to make that mammoth fountain at a half a ton a day? We're talking, you know, of 180 tons a year. You know how much that is in a century? A century builds more than that. And yet they sit there and they got 60,000 years in the pamphlet. And I asked the guy, you know, wait, 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 I, I, I can't figure this out. I always play the dumb act, you know. Take a look at this picture. What does it tell you? I hate to take you all to school, <laughs> but maybe we need to. Who knows? No, no, that's a mountain range out west, Utah. What's interesting about it? Hmm. Well, you see the strata, and that strata is laid in hydraulically. It's all laid in by water action. All right, it's laid in. When water lays it in, what, uh, what level, uh, how does it lay it in? Level, absolutely level. We know that when that was formed, it was perfectly level. Now, something happened, obviously, an upthrust, right? Okay, we all see that? Now you say, well, so what? All right, now comes the next, so what? What is important about this? This picture is staggering. This blows any evolutionist right out of the tree. There's no fault cracks in here, fissures. If this was hired when it was upthrust, we'd have to have it all cracked and broken, wouldn't we? When it was thrust up, it was all mud, all of it. Do you know how long it takes that stuff to solidify? A couple months, six at the most? We're not talking about this thing being laid in millions of years because if it was upthrust, it was this high, the rest would become in flat, wouldn't it? It's all curved, no fissures, all made at the same time. The whole mountain, bam. Does anybody not see? If you don't, I'll go, I'm happy to go again. This is the Rocky Mountain Range. You have the Appalachian Mountains all the way from Maine, all the way down to Georgia, human footprints in granite. Human footprints in granite. 1937, the head of the American Geological Society says that if there's a human footprint in granite, we've got hundreds of them. Every geologist better get a job as a truck driver. Now, let's take a look at this picture. This is Chicago Museum, another one of those nice little windows. Now here we've got uh, a, a, a monkey and a chimpanzee and a gibbon and an ape and a, and a human being. Now, back there, if I didn't have it backwards and upside down or backwards there, you could read it. But anyway, <coughs> what they're saying back here, and you know, I asked these questions 30 years ago and I looked at this thing. They say, look, now, first thing, remember, we do have a fact. These are facts, actual skeletons, which are facts, aren't they? All right? They are scientific facts. But now watch what is extrapolated from those facts. What they say is this. You see the similarity between them all. They all have rib cages. They all have phalanges. They all have the basic spinal column that the basic engineering structure, even though changing the length of the arms and so forth and the different little shapes of the skull and the ridge bone that all bipeds outside of human beings have down the middle of the skull, only the human being doesn't have it. That's how you can tell a human skull from, a, from a, uh, any other biped is the, the ridge bone. But anyway, they say, see the similarity. All right, that's a fact too, isn't it? Okay, the similarity is a fact, it is there. And it is fact that these are what they say it is. I'm not questioning those facts. But watch their conclusion, their extrapolation. 
They say the similarity shows that they must come from a common ancestor. Now, I'm going to take the same facts and come up with another conclusion. And what you have to do is say, what is more reasonable? The conclusion that they come up with or the one I do? I'm going to say, you see the similarity? This shows that they follow the same design, which means there must have been the same designer. You cannot have things following the same plan unless there was a planner capable of carrying out the plan. If it was unplanned, we would not expect similarity. We'd expect great diversity, wouldn't we? We'd finally expect all sorts of accidental <laughs> uh, weird creatures, but we don't find all those green things with the eyeballs sticking up on the stems like you get in the movies and in the, in the cartoons. We find things all on a very sound plan, following a blueprint. If you went out in the woods and found a watch, would you believe it evolved? Yet we see things vastly more intricate and want to believe in accidental creation. Have we ever seen anything accidentally created? They just happen to pop. It's like, you know, uh, throwing a typewriter in a washing machine and coming out with a Magna Carta. This is the way they want to say this whole thing is. What does it mean? It means it has no purpose. This earth is a very, very, very peculiar place. If this world was only 20 or 30 degrees, 25 degrees warmer, we would not have the hydrospheres. We have now total cloud cover. We would have uh, uh, an entirely different condition. If it was 50 degrees warmer, life could not exist in this earth. If this world was some 30 degrees cooler or 40 degrees cooler, we would again have a big problem because of the fact of the ice formations. If water did not happen, just accidentally happened to be at its least, uh, at least density at 34 degrees, our oceans would freeze in the bottom up and all marine life would be non-existent. Just happened, you understand that. If we did not happen to have the oxygen, free oxygen in the atmosphere, life would be impossible. The fact that the weather temperature, the moisture, the rain that carries the water from the oceans to the, uh, to the dry land and waters the vegetation, all of these things are so peculiar that no condition like it exists in the known universe. Nowhere do we have any weather systems. Nowhere the distance from our earth, sun to this earth is so peculiar, uh, particularly set that any further out or in, mercury, a molten at the temperature of lead. You can imagine living on that, how much evolution you're going to have. You're molten, oh, you say something could live. Well, what do you want to dream up? You can dream up anything you want you haven't got the foggiest thing to support such a theory of anything living at 450 degrees below zero Fahrenheit on Pluto. You can dream it if you want to, but of the entire known universe, we do not know of a single body outside of this one, this peculiar body that you and I live on, that has even the possibility of sustaining life. They spent billions and billions to go to the, uh, uh, Mars for one reason to try to find the a evidence that life does, could, or ever had existed on Mars. And their evidence came up negative. They went to the moon chipping those rocks. They were not looking for minerals. They were looking for fossils. They were looking for an evidence of any sort of biological life. They came up without it. They have now abandoned any hope of Venus, never had any hope of Mercury, and a certainly Jupiter and the others are in, in, in impossible. And Saturn, basically gases, a very cold temperature. Let's turn the light on and let's see. <clears throat> now the points I want to make with this little uh, dissertation on evolution is one, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with what I've said, what I want to do is show you there's a different view but why is this different view never given? Why isn't it on your television, on your radio, your commentators, in your newspaper, in articles, in books? Why isn't it uh, taught in school? Why isn't it presented as an alternative view? Why is it not? 
because it isn't important. What is important is the conclusions drawn from the position in which they have. Now watch this. First thing I learned when I got my Philosophy 101 course is, well, <clears throat> they start out, and I'm going to show you how, how, when you get to school, be careful, you young people. Watch this, if you want to protect yourself and your mind. They start out with a little thing. Here's the professor. He's got his grade book out in front of you. She's pretty intimidated right away. I mean, who are you going to talk against the grade? You needed a little check mark in order to get it, become a sophomore, right? So anyway, uh, he says, <clears throat> well, of course, as you know, we're all products of our environment. And then he goes on from that assumption and starts building on that assumption. Question, are we products of our environment? Answer, no, we are not. If you start out with a false assumption, you can prove anything by logic. If I have a false assumption and have proper logical deduction from a false assumption, I must come out with a false conclusion. You notice? His logic, you look and say, his logic is so wonderful. Yes, his logic is wonderful. What was his assumption? He said, he it made you give him one free. Well, of course, we all know that we're a product of our environment. I don't know that, and I want him to show me that. He hasn't got one shred of that. He just said it, didn't he? And for that, I'm supposed to build my whole philosophy and life on, on an assertion made without fact or foundation. You see? Once he let you give him a freezy, he says, well, let, let's for the sake of argument assume such and such. And then you say, well, okay, for the fun of it, yeah, let's go along with that. Then he says, then if that's true, then this, and if this, then that, then if this, then that, and this, and that. And all of a sudden, man, he's got black as white and up as down. You see? Because you gave him a free one. Never give the guy a free one. Just stop there and say, show me. Well, well, we all know. No, I don't know. Can you demonstrate that for me? <laughs> well, <laughs> everybody knows that. <laughs> of course, everybody. No, I don't know that. Boy, you just blew their balloon. That guy isn't going to be able to teach all semester. He's going to be in there hemming and hawing and dragging his feet. He just, his whole lesson plan just went. When you call him down and make him come up with a fact, he hasn't got one. Now, I want to show you, there's two views. If we're a product of our environment, then, we're, then our environment creates, just, uh, just my, my professor, since we're a product of our environment, of course, when this person goes out, for example, and commits murder, he didn't do it. The most influential thing in his whole life was his parents, right? So therefore, his parents are really guilty for making him a murderer. It's the parents who are at fault. Do you see that attitude being taught today? Once you buy evolution, you've got to buy that. Now, if the parents are at fault, they're not at fault because, after all, they're a product of their environment, which was their parents, which was the fault of their parents, which was the fault of their parents. You know what it is? Nobody's at fault. There is no personal responsibility. And we have a society without personal responsibility, so what do we have to have? We have to have a state that takes that responsibility. That's going to direct because you're not responsible and you can't be held personally. The state will be held. It is the state's going to take care of you when you're sick and when you're old. It's good. The state's going to take care of you when you're in need. The state's going to take care of your mental problems, social problems, racial problems, whatever problem you've got. We got an agency. All we demand is your obedience and money. Do you want to know why they have that educational system? To get you to feed the money and, uh, and go along with this absolute assertion. You sit in your head and say, it's silly, it's insane. It's absolutely insane, but it's logical. Yes, it is, if you take that assumption that we're a product of our environment. If you believe it's, evolution is true, all we got to do is aid the, in the evolution, the upward reach of man, and he's going to reach on and, until he finally reaches perfection. Well, I want to tell you, you're not going to reach it. Now let's take a look at what really is the case. If I have an accidental change in a complex structure, what do I get? A more structured or a less structured? Do I get disorder or order out of an accidental change? You get disorder. How do you get evolution out of disorder? Evolution means that accidental changes are creating a more complex uh, structure than before. But all cases of evidence we've ever seen is that accidental change Sure, it's possible if I had 2,000 pins and kept dropping them enough times in, a, say, 20 billion years of it, I, they would all land in rows with the heads all up. But don't count on it. The chances are very high against it. Now, what they want to say, and this is what their argument is, that one out of a billion evolutions or a million evolutions must be organized, orderly. That is more orderly than what was before. 
that it is, it is evolutionary, since we have mutations going on all the time. Well, that's all right. Give them one. There's no problem. I'm, I'm free. I'll give them that one. I'll give them one in a million. What about the 999,999 disorganizing mutations? If I have 999,000 disorganizing and one organizing, am I getting more organized or more disorganized? They call that evolution. I call it devolving or devolution. We are, every creature is breaking down. Do you know why you don't see so good? I notice I, my eyes are getting pretty bad. Now, you don't jump like you did when you were 20 anymore, do you? Huh? You can't run as well. The breath gets short. The skin starts sagging. I don't want to just pick you. The hair gets gray. Mine's getting there, too. See? Uh, I can get out, you know, and I, I sit with these young guys. I can lift as much, and I can, I, I'm as strong. I can, uh, I can do everything as well as, as a 20-year-old, except the elasticity isn't there. The ache is, uh, yes. Yes, I can lift it. But it's just like here, you can go out, if you can play basketball pretty well, and you get 45, you can go out and run with those kids, and you can shoot with those kids. But when you jump, your feet don't go off the floor. They go up with that ball, and you jump, and nothing happens. You see, the day you were born, you started dying. Every cell is in the process of decay. Now watch something. They're going to measure evolution by decay rates. That's what they're using, decay rates, aren't they? Carbon-14 decay rates, potassium argon decay rates. How do you measure evolution by decay rates? It should be by generation rates. You see the whole absurdity of measuring evolution by decay processes? The fact of the matter is that all species are in the process of decay. We don't like to believe that. We want to think we're the greatest thing ever came down the pike. You're the worst that has ever been down the pike. Your ancestors were superior to you biologically, mentally, physically, and in every way. You don't like that, do you? You want to think of them as somebody well backward in the cave. Is that what you want to think? Uh-uh. That isn't the fact of the matter. Did you see this movie, 2001? Here they sat there. How many saw that movie, 2001, The Space Odyssey? They start out with these bleh, creatures with the red eyes and the hair rolling around like a bunch of animals in this pit, see? And finally, after a million years, one of them got bing, an idea. First idea, he took a bone and hit another guy with a head. Wham! Oh, that was the first invention, you know? And they thought oh, that was the greatest game they ever saw. And they all got a bone and they started hitting each other over the head, having a great ball out there. It didn't take any thousand years to figure out hitting by over the head. Cain uh, figured it out right away. That's yeah, absurd. How long would it take any creature to find out how to hit another creature? But you want to have that evolution, you take economics. First course, first chapter one, the evolution of economics. Sociology, the evolution of sociology. Psychology, the evolution of psychology. You take any field, the evolution, the evolution, the first chapters of every text, right? The evolution of it. As if our ancestors were stupid. And we're the greatest thing came down to pie. I'm afraid it's the other way around. We're the worst example. And instead of going up, we are going down. That's why half the living file are gone. And more are going all the time. Now, I don't want to bother you at all with this little thing, but I'm going to give you a little bit of scientific fact. For those of you who have great long range views of this world, no life will exist in this world after 3120 anyway. At 3120, the magnetic field of this Earth is scheduled to shut down. That is, at the half-life of 1,400 years, there will not be enough electrical output to jump the gap from pole to pole. With the loss of the magnetic field, the Van Allen belt will break up and shower this world with such radiation that all living forms will simply die. Uh, if it's here, <laughs> if this world is going to last that long. But don't let it worry you and I, because we're not going to live that long, no matter what these doctors say. They're not going to make it, right? This world is a temporary place, obviously, and it is a degenerating place. Everything in it is wearing out. The radiation, the uranium is wearing down. The energy sources are running down. The sun is burning out some 14 million tons per second. It's going down. Now, you say that's dismal? Don't let it worry you, really, too much. For your lifetime and for your children's lifetime and anybody you know or gonna know, Ah, they won't notice it, all right? 
unless the Lord returns, then it won't make any difference either. <laughs> See? So, don't let that worry. But the point is, the whole concept that we had before evolution was that the creature was responsible in law, which now the creature is not responsible. He was responsible morally. Now he's not responsible morally. I mean, it's to each his own. Morals are whatever we make up. Because after all, it's all in the process of evolution. I read in law cases, I've been studying quite a bit of law lately, and they're talking about the evolving law. The rules change, the right and wrong change, is murder change, is killing another person change? Is our responsibility change? What happens with a society without law? You have a jungle. Everybody's got to hide from everybody. So, uh, society ceases to function. Production ceases to function. Because without law, without an orderly society, we all must become a law unto ourselves. And this is strict barbarism, and such a society cannot produce. And when you buy the concepts that these people teach. Now, I want to just finish with one point, and we'll let you go. And if you want to talk to me, I, I, I'm a talker, as you obviously know. I can talk for any length of time. But let me <clears throat> show you something. I'm going to give you proofs, a proof now. I gave this to a guy on a plane today, <clears throat> and it about bombed him out, because he was talking about the, he was laughing about the Bible, see? OK. There are only four possible. Huh. I hope this stuff comes off. Gosh, we'll get some pretty colors here. Four possible. I never used this before, anyway. Four possible explanations of the universe that you and I are in. I want to give you some rules of logic. If I'm going to make a, a deduction reason, I have to give every possible conceivable, every possible or every conceivable alternative. If I have them all in there, then one of them has to be right. If, however, I've left one out, so many people do, they say, well, you, which you choose, this position or that position? Generally, they left the real one out. You know, they gave you two false ones to choose from. Particularly in religion, all these religious doctrines, they always give you two or three, all three being wrong. And you've got to pick one of the three. And people sit and argue and fight over years and years and years, the three wrong arguments, uh, three wrong positions. So I've got to have them all in there. Now, the universe that you and I are in, the very stuff we're made of, this table and everything else is made of, the, the very atoms or the dust or whatever you want, if you want to have it formed out of over millions of years of clouds of dust, banging or unbanging, whether you want big bang theories or anything else, if you've got a big bang theory, you still got to have something banging, all right? And the big bang theory is, a, is an absurdity in itself, but it, let's, that's the one they got to use today because it's about the best they got. There are only four possible explanations of the universe that we observe. One, that the very stuff it's made of has always been here. Now, it may have been dust, it may have been clouds, it may have been bangs or explosions that formed over revolving all the stuff, pictures they give you in the nice movies and on TV, right? But that the stuff that it's composed of, the elements themselves, have always been in existence. We'll call that eternality of matter, the eternal theory. And this one is one they try to give to you, but they give to you without any facts. In fact, it's very interesting that they never give you facts on any of their positions, which bothers me in no end. All right? Possibility two, that the stuff, the elements that the universe is composed of has not always been here. But it got here by a natural process. This, by the way, is the theory of evolution. And we'll call this natural generation. Possibility three. That the stuff that the universe is made of has not always been in existence, but it got in here by non-natural means. All right? We'll call that, watch my word now, supranatural generation. Supra does not mean supernatural. It's supra. It means not natural, an unnatural, okay, generation. Well, we have to you say, well, what is an unnatural generation, right? Well, I'll explain that because I'll tell you what a natural generation is. Natural means we can go and see it happening. It's in nature. We can observe it. Okay? So this is something that can't be observed because it's not happening now. I can only observe what's happening now. I can't observe something that happened a million years ago. 
Can you prove that Louis Pasteur ever lived? No. You can believe it, right? You have some evidences to indicate that he lived, but you can't prove it. See, you can't prove what happened yesterday. You can testimony for it. You can't prove your own birth except one thing. Your life now indicates you were, right? All right. <clears throat> now, supra, natural generation. The things got here, but not by any observable means that we can observe. By any means we can observe, all right? And four, imaginary. Now, <clears throat> this fourth one is the one taught in philosophy courses today at the local brain tanks or brain laundries, as I like to call them. The purpose of these places is to keep you from being able to think. Now, an imaginary system is this. If a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there to hear it, is there a sound? They start you out with those nice little questions. Watch those philosophy classes. Oh, are they a dangerous? They are a swamp of ignorance, of lies and false leadings. They start you out with that. Oh, that sounds so nice, and we can sit and discuss that. Well, let's all discuss that. And so they have all you nim-nims sit around and discuss that back and forth while he directs your conclusion by little inserts that he puts in, and you want to look smart to him, right? So you agree and go along, and everybody thinks everybody else agrees, and pretty soon you all come out with the same idea. <clears throat> yes. Now, is there any sound? If a tree falls and there's no ear to hear it? Well, we could discuss that in this room for the next four or five hours, and we'll never come to a conclusion until we define the word sound. If sound is the vibrations, yes. If the sound is the vibrations hitting the eardrum, no. But let's define it. Undefined, you can sit there and run around these rabbit, squirrely, cottonwood ideas for forever, you know, and they're absolutely num num uh, position, you see? But then they start out <coughs> if do things exist, are you really here? Can you prove your own existence? Try logically to prove your existence, that you're here. Well, you sit there and say, well, oh, I think I can. Well, I don't know how to do it. Well, I, I guess you can. Well, <laughs> we all agree we can't, all right? We all agree we can't prove we're here. So we all can agree we can't prove we're here. We can't prove we're each other are here. Or anything exists. Then after you blow down this brain blower for a while, and you might as well put a 45 to your head if you follow this line, because you're blowing your brains out. Why? You're incapable of logical reasoning once you've gone through this. You're incapable, legally, you're insane when you're incapable of dealing with reality. 